Hey everyone, this is Dr. Fox, and thank you again for supporting CRPN and CRPN Central Podcast. To continue our mission, please like, subscribe, and share this content with your professional community. And if you'd like to sponsor CRPN or our podcast and our dedicated voice to the industry, I'd really appreciate your help. Please contact us today at info at crpaynet.com for details. Listen, as a sponsor, we're funding this study. Not only that, our new drug is going to revolutionize medicine, save countless lives, and make our shareholders a lot of money. We are the CRO. Our value proposition to sponsors is abundantly clear. So in a nutshell, save time, save money, reduce risk, all in exchange for money. After all, we are running a business. We, the sites, can help. We have the physicians and the patients you need to be successful. Six months later. Why is this taking so long? Time is money, CROs. This should have been done by now. The shareholders are getting frustrated and the competition is closing in. We just like to say that your, your timeline is not delayed because of poor planning on our part. We thought for sure you and the sites could read our minds. Yes, 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 yes. Sometimes we do have a bit of a, let's just say, a communication kerfuffle. Quality control issues aside, you have to understand, these things happen. After all, this is a business, and with any business, there are risks. Things fall through the cracks from time to time. But rest assured, these are extremely uncommon black swan events. We can only do so much with the negligent resources you give us. Your prices are not competitive. Our physicians are discouraged. You're behind on your payments and every promise you made to us is broken. Listen, you have to understand, this is a business. We're not always going to be able to afford the bells and whistles and gold plating. What we I don't need is for you sites is to have done. the appropriate we're staffing. You're the boss. We you're the clients. It costs but a lot. So it's just there's no extra money we expect to get. You never even get them on time. And you have to It's not our fault. business. We are the ones that have the responsible money for all the experts. We hired you. You claim to be experts. You can't give us anything for the delays in pain. Hello? Would everyone just please stop for a second? Hi. I'm the patient. Look. I just want to feel better. I'm willing to put my life and my health on the line to help those in the future. All for a little bit of gas money and no beneficial guarantee for me. To all of our clinical research professionals, I hope this puts our priorities into perspective. The next time you get caught up in the grind of money and toxicity, please just stop. I'm here to serve that patient, and I hope that you'll join me. Research may be a business, but remember what you are in this business to do. If we don't meet our main objectives, we should change things until something works. Welcome to CRPN Central, the official podcast of the Clinical Research Payment Network. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel Fox. CRPN Central discusses the real issues with our clinical research industry to explore and identify mutually beneficial solutions for all of our stakeholders. Payments to sites are one of the biggest problems we as clinical sites experience in the industry. Clinical sites must not only maintain rigorous regulatory processes during their trials, but now they must also shoulder millions in debt. They are not structured to retain. We know this is a problem. Articles were written over a decade ago warning us of these consequences. And yet, the problems persist still to this day for all of our site administrators. But why? Episode 2 is entitled Payments payments, payments. By now, I'm sure you know what we are talking about today. That's right, payments, meaning the financial compensation received by clinical research sites for the services they provide. We are, after all, the Clinical Research Payment Network.
Today, I'm asking two of our industry's finest to talk about their perspectives when it comes to payments during clinical trials. One holds a strong sites perspective in the industry, and the other views trials from a sponsor's lens. To maintain valid comparisons, both interviews will utilize the same questions, and my guests did not have the questions before the interviews. After the interviews, we will regroup to compare similarities and differences in perspectives and priorities, and perhaps discover the possibilities of mutually beneficial solutions for everyone involved. Our first guest is well known in the industry for his voice, his opinions, and his expertise in clinical site operations. Brad Hightower is the founder of the independent research organization Hightower Clinical. He is well known for his site advocacy voice on Note to File podcast and Note to File live events. And he is known within the industry as the professional who isn't afraid to ask the tough questions and communicate exactly how he feels. Brad is a good friend of mine, and I really appreciate him taking the time to speak with us today. Please welcome Mr. Brad Hightower. All right, Mr. Brad Hightower, how are you doing today, sir? Dr. Fox, good, uh, happy Monday morning. <laughs> happy Monday morning. I don't know about you, but it's windy as crazy out here. Yeah, we just dealt with a bunch of tornadoes in Oklahoma City last night. Nothing too too major, but a bunch of little mm-hmm. little spin ups. So uh, a little early in the year for it, but uh, it's already here. Well, Brad, thank you for coming to CRP and Central today. I really appreciate you coming on. You are a voice of the industry that everyone highly respects. Today, we're going to talk about payments. One of our favorite topics. I think that <laughs> you and I were both pretty vocal about payments on LinkedIn. And I really want the CRP and Central audience to hear the perspectives of payments. Before we get started, do you think that payments are a problem in clinical research? Yeah, I mean, I think they're they're a huge problem. Now that we know that payments are a problem, the first question, could you walk me through your understanding of your perceived clinical trial payment process through a trial's entire life cycle? Sure. I guess we go all the way to the beginning. I mean, if you even, you know, start with budget negotiation and, you know, terms, negotiation of terms, which is oftentimes a months long process uh, when it doesn't need to be and requires a lot of time and, and energy and therefore money to, to get through. So, uh, you know, you kind of start there and you really start to already become a sort of disillusioned with the process. And obviously there's a lot of little pieces that are a part of that, that are problems we've talked about all the time, right? Like withholding, still being an issue for, for CROs and sometimes sponsors and screen fail rates not being adequate or the startup costs needing to be justified to the point of absolute pulling your hair out from the site side. So honestly, and again, we've, we've beat this stuff up a lot in the past, but you can really go nuts with it. But I'll try to focus on my understanding of the process from there. So let's say we get through all those things, which are conversations of their own in a lot of ways. And then we execute our contract. We do SIV, in which point we're able to start invoicing for study startup, let's say. We send out an invoice and we don't know what happens. It just kind of goes into the ether. There are some sponsors <laughs> that occasionally will uh, acknowledge a receipt of an invoice, but frankly, it's it's kind of uncommon, uh, unfortunately. But if you're lucky or smart or good, you've got a good system for tracking your invoices, right? Not a lot of sites do, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. You shoot off an invoice and the clock starts ticking. You know, we use a CTMS, so we've got an easy idea. We can see how long payments have been outstanding. At that point, 30 days pass and you follow up with the generic email address that you sent the invoice to and you still don't really hear anything. Again, this is just the beginning of the process. This isn't even, you know, your normal milestone payments or study payments that you receive as for enrolling patients. So this is how you kick off your relationship with the sponsor or CRO. So I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but basically you're spending a lot of times, oftentimes shooting emails into the ether to a generic email box, uh, hoping somebody's paying attention on the other side. You may get an answer every now and then. I view more if you start threatening your, your CRA for <laughs> trying to shake <laughs> yep. them down for the money. And eventually you'll get paid if you're lucky. It may be 60, 90. Sometimes it's been nine months before I've received a startup payment. And that's wow. not an exaggeration. Wow. And you, you definitely didn't wait nine months to do the work. 
<laughs> no, absolutely not. It has, it's oftentimes it's done before we've even signed the contract, most of it, mm -hmm. for, for that startup payment, right? It's done before yep. you've even agreed to the terms of it, which is a little problematic in its own right. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I'll be really honest with you, the sort of ongoing study payment process is completely opaque for sites, I think. There's a lot of assumptions and every trial is different, and that's not often not laid out well or if it, often not at all in the contract, what triggers those payments. Mm -hmm. If you're receiving, let's say even you get what you want and you're getting a monthly payment. Well, is that based off of data in the EDC? Is it based, based off of data in the EDC that's been monitored? Does mm -hmm. the whole visit need to be complete? Does it need to be free of queries? Do you need to invoice for it? Mm -hmm. Is the sponsor going to do it automatically in the background? So a lot of times those things are not clear to you as a site, especially in the beginning. Yeah. So again, and even... You know, on those terms, it's it feels sometimes like every single sponsor and CRO packages that communication in different ways. Sometimes it's built into the contract. Sometimes it's built as like an addendum to payment terms and payment options. And just as you said, sometimes they just don't talk about it. They just expect you to understand their processes. Well, and even lately, we've had some that have been completely wrong. They've been labeled <laughs> one way and then only to find out that that's not actually the case at all. You know, unfortunately, sometimes even if it's present in the contract, you may not be able to, to trust that term that, that, that's in there. So, yeah. And even again, let's let's say you go on and get paid, and then say you get paid on time if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. More often than not, the only way I know I've been paid is because some money shows up in my bank account. I don't know what patients it's for. I don't know which procedures it's for. It's just a lump sum from a CRO or sponsor okay. that's hit my bank yeah. account. And sometimes so, that means you don't even know what trial it's for. Yeah. If you're, I mean, if you're a big site or you're running a lot of trials, you may have six studies with PPD. Just mm -hmm. saying PPD and then a numerical amount does not really help you in determining mm -hmm. what studies are, are paying you appropriately. As you can see, it's a really a chaotic mess on the site side. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been pretty well like, documented at this point that you know sites are in a real bad spot uh, when it comes to site payments. That organization in particular, the one that you mentioned, I've received remittances from them where a single remittance had multiple trials in it. <laughs> yeah, that's insane, right? How yeah. are you ever and there was supposed no, to know that? Yeah, there was, and there was no describer. It was, here's a bunch of money, and it, I had to drill down. But then it's, how exactly do you remit this? Where does the money go? What money do I post? It is literally a wild, wild west for payments. It's amazing. That goes from startup all the way to end i assume even when you get to the end of the payment cycle let's say you close out the site let's say the patients are gone your work for payments isn't over then this so then what happens yeah you still got you know your close out invoicing yeah, any hold back that may have existed and even you know that's its own thing too there's no telling when you might see that and again even just trying to reconcile outstanding payments is obviously challenging because you know you don't know what's been missed oftentimes because there's been such poor reconciliation poor documentation from the sponsor side so i feel like really unfortunately if you're a site even with your most earnest organized efforts it's chaos at the very mm -hmm. least you know again even if you go to great lengths to try to stay on top of and reconcile your finances, especially if you grow, uh, it's just going to be, it's incredibly challenging. Now, holdback is one thing. I've waited a year, 18 months for holdback after a closeout. Have you ever had to experience clawback? Elaborate. Clawback is where the CRO comes to you and says, we've paid you too much money. You owe us. I've not, fortunately, in, in all my time, I've never seen that uh, be the case. I, I know I have heard of cases of that, but not mm -hmm. experienced it personally. I'm going to knock on some wood right now. <laughs> we had a very poorly managed trial. And I mean, trial to where this is the one where they didn't pay us for 18 months. We had to escalate it. And they tried to put out the fire and they did that. At the end of the trial, when everyone had closed out, the CRO came back and said, well, you owe us $32,000. And that's all they said. You owe us $32,000. And I said, I can't. It's, why? What exactly did you pay? Give me fully itemized. Where's the transparency? I'm not going to do this unless I know line by line why this is happening. And wouldn't you know it with a single pushback, they came back and they said, oh, uh, that was a miscalculation. I'm sorry. Now you owe us $20,000. And I said, where's the itemization? Show me. Uh, two weeks later, it happened again. 
never mind. You know what? We're just going to write this off. <laughs> the holdback is one thing, but the clawback is another. From beginning to end, it's a terrible relationship experience in payments for sites. That's what I've experienced. And it feels like it's an industry standard. I don't know about you, but I've gotten comment after comment from multiple different kinds of organizations saying the same thing. What you're saying is spot on. I go through the same thing. It's a big problem. And it's something that we're going to have to address. And I'm glad that we're having this conversation. I hope that people hear this and maybe they know, wow, I guess I'm not the only one who goes through this. Yeah, I, I think, you know, obviously if you're at a site, well, even that's not true. I mean, I've worked in places where, I mean, a coordinator has no idea how this kind of stuff is working. Yep. So they may not be real in tune uh, with that. Obviously more, you know, your site owners do, but I'm still surprised by how, when we have these conversations, how shocked people are. And so, and so again, I think it's a good thing that we're having these conversations publicly because I mean, frankly, <laughs> It's in the best interest of everyone if we have a strong and thriving site community. And that means sites that are well financially taken care of and can grow and can innovate and can serve their communities without worrying about they need to keep their doors open or mm -hmm. keep the lights turned on. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's one of those things that it's shocking and it should be shocking for anyone who who's not familiar with it. But uh, yeah, for better or worse, it's sort of become the norm. And I, I hate that that's the case because it does in many ways create a bad taste in the mouths of sites. And pretty soon sites don't like the sponsor. Sponsors mm -hmm. or CROs are upset because sites are complaining about money. And then you again, you've just got sort of a, a bad situation. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. I think we're we're in the middle of a pretty big toxic environment of miscommunications and misunderstandings. Question two, Brad, can you give me three really good experiences of a time where you had positive experiences in clinical trial payments? Okay, give me the good ones. Tell me the good it, stories. Yeah, it does happen. We recently had a, <laughs> so I guess it was good and bad, depending how you look at it. But, you know, we received a startup payment before I could even get it invoiced. It happened so quickly and auto wow. automated. And it was a big sponsor. I'd like to give them credit, but I feel like I might say the wrong one. So I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, they paid, again, automatically. Now, they didn't tell us they were paying us. That would have been nice to get heads up that we were being paid. But it hit my account and I was like, whoa, this is surprising. So mm -hmm. great. Again, I don't know why that can't happen all the time. I mean, the sponsor knows when an SIV is completed or a contract is executed. There's no reason that couldn't be automated. Makes sense. And, a good trigger. Right. Yeah. And I'll say this, and this is maybe a more generic positive, but I do think in general, sponsors are being more open to site sort of demands, if you will. Mm -hmm. They seem like they're giving a little bit more in terms of when we're asking for changes. Again, some of these big CROs would not back off of quarterly payments. Yep. And now yep. I feel like it's pretty common for the, if we say no, or we want to be paid monthly, they'll say, okay, we understand that. But um, then they don't keep the promises. Like I was going to say, like whether or not they actually false. make the payment is another yeah. question, but at least they seem willing and understanding yeah. in regards to the fact that we can't be sitting around waiting, sitting on our hands for, for cash, especially when we're enrolling heavily and allocating a lot of time and resources to their study. And then, you know, lastly, I think we've worked with, um, I mean, I will shout these guys out, but Delphi Diagnostics. Kudos to Delphi. They've been, Very yeah, good they've group. been really great. And they've also done something that, I would encourage sponsors to do, which is don't just hand it over to the CRO and then walk away. I still engage with your sites because ultimately it's not clear to us where the problem is. Sometimes a sponsor can look real bad to us, even though it may not be their fault because they're not engaged. They handed it over to the CRO. CRO is the one delaying things, but the sponsor may get the blame. Anyways, all this is to say they've done a really great job of communicating directly and being very sensitive to you know our needs for a study where we've enrolled 500 plus patients for them so they've been really great uh, and really it's just that's just been a matter of communication which is should be minimum a bare minimum and i've had the same thing i love the time when you send an invoice you email an invoice or you do whatever it is and literally it it's within the half hour that you sent it, they they sent the payment. And I've had that too with sponsors too. It's like, oh, so people are listening. People do understand. They understand that when I send an invoice, I actually need the money. It's not just kind <laughs> right. of like a low priority. Well, you don't have to wait until literally the last agreed upon day to mm -hmm. start processing the payment. I, I don't, fully, don't fully understand that reasoning. No, I, I'm sure there's some financial benefit there must be for 
the other side to hang on to that money. Again, yeah. it's it's mind boggling. What they say, it, it costs money to process money. So they have payment cycles. So you have to do these payment cycles. I think it would be amazing if you could fit into the contracts a definition of net 30, meaning solely net 30 is defined as the time at which money is recognized in a site's financial institution. That way it's like, Net 30 means it's in the bank. It's not like you're, you know, the checks in the mail. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's it funny, be nice. but you still get a lot of that. It, it decides, oh, it's processing. It's processing. Yeah, it's it may processing. take uh, it may take us a week and a half to process it, and then it'll have to go through, you know, take a few 2A days to clear from the bank. So, yeah. you know, we're looking at yeah. three weeks. And I'm like, dude, come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's spin the tables. Tell me your worst experience you've ever had in payments. I'm sure these this one's a lot easier to... We probably yeah, have a lot to choose from, unfortunately, right? Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, I'll say in the distant past, you know, we worked with uh, sponsors who went out of business. Oh, no. And that was a long time ago, but they had folded mid-study and had owed the institution. I mean, this this was, you know, six figures and wow. up and gone. And I don't think that money ever made its way to the institution. I'm dealing with a similar, well, it's not similar, but I'm dealing with a situation now where a sponsor owes us we're creeping up on half a million dollars to sponsor wow. us. Well, the study oh. started in September of 2022. We enrolled our first patient. We capped out our enrollment, 45 patients just at the beginning of this month. We were supposed to, we were agreed upon monthly payments. We've not received a single payment. Since September. Yeah, since September when we enrolled our first patient. We have not seen a single payment come through. And we've heard heard every excuse from them. They were late to get their EDC up, and that was their payment trigger. Well, once it got up, we had to hurry up and enter a bunch of back data. Well, then we had to process all that data. Oh, now, actually, we need you to invoice us, even though we didn't have to invoice. It says in the contract you don't have to invoice, but now you do. Surprise, surprise. So, yeah, we're dealing with that as we speak. And because they want to go back to the statistician to try to give us more patients to open it up so we can enroll more. And I'm like, no, we're not doing any more work until you, you pay us. It's funny that they actually have the audacity to do that. I mean, do they even realize how non-compliant they are? Well, and again, you've got a bunch of different parties that yep. are involved who some don't. I mean, they don't care. You know, the CMO probably doesn't care if I'm getting paid or it's not really in there. It's below their pay grade to, to deal yeah. with. But instead they're, oh, well, you guys, we, you know, great job, you know, enroll, enroll some more patients for us. Well, no, get us paid, please. And it's tough as a site because you don't want to sound or be petty. But I will say I'm, I'm thankful that the PI is very understanding. And he's like, yes, I understand that that much money can ruin a small company mm -hmm. like ours and like a lot of other small sites and site networks that are out there. This isn't because we're trying to buy yachts. It's because we've got employees to pay. You know, they pay their benefits. They have kids. I mean, we're just trying to take care of our families and our employees' families. It's insane to mm -hmm. have to go jump through these hoops. Going back to the one that just folded with the patients on board, do you just slowly and safely discontinue the patients from the trial? Yeah, back then, yeah. Back and that then. was, uh, yeah, that was a much, yeah, you're talking about the one where the sponsor just folded up entirely. Folded. Yeah. yeah. So I think they did have a somewhat thought out like discontinuation process, but they had never paid. So they were basically close the patients out, keep trying to get our payments and then, you know, play the game of like, is it worth hiring counsel to go after them? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Do they even, I mean, did they file bankruptcy? Are we even going to see the money? Is it even, yeah. does it exist? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's another ether. Yeah, so exactly. you've just not been paid. Things have been flat out gone it's been late. Have you ever been through situations where you were paid the wrong amount of money? Yes. And probably even more so than we know, just because again, the reconciliation process is basically like throwing darts against a wall sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. So we definitely I, have, we've definitely been able to go back and argue with sponsors. So again, thankfully with a well put together CTMS, at least you can have a pretty good idea. Mm -hmm. It's a little easier. You know, obviously you can do it with things like spreadsheets, but you know, for me, it's really easy with the CTMS to, to be able to say, oh, well, we know this procedure costs costs this much so you only mm -hmm. paid us this much what's going on here uh, but again right. like everything else it doesn't happen overnight it might take weeks it might take months to get corrected most likely it's going to take yep. months there was one sponsor in particular a huge global sponsor huge one of the biggest in the in the industry that decided they wanted to execute an extension to their trial they needed more data we've had that before we renegotiated the budget two years later they're still paying us at the old rates they mm. never <laughs> activated the new rates from the renegotiated budgets. Every single time we get paid, this poor payment process person, they know me. I said, oh, must be payment time again for Dr. Fox. He's coming back. And sure enough, we got paid the original rate. And it was like a couple thousand bucks here and there. And it probably cost more money to chase the money than to 
you know, just kind of roll over. But it adds up. It adds up a lot. And that's how we have to pay. So given what we talked about, the good and the bad, what do you as a site feel makes the best payment experience in the trial? Yeah, I mean, I think very clear contract terms and language. And then, I mean, honestly, if as long as it's clear and I know, just make, just follow it, follow through on what we've agreed upon. You know, obviously I'd love to see actual itemization on these, these payments. I mean, we've seen tools like Greenfire as a site payment tool, which I think Pfizer uses. And it's mm-hmm. actually really nice because I can see when a payment gets processed, it's right there for me to see. I can see exactly what it's for. I can see when it's cleared as someone to expect it. It's a very simple tool. I'd love to see something like that implemented more frequently. Greenfire is a portal, right? So you have to enter a portal to access it? You do. You okay. do. You have to sign in, but it's at least there for you to yeah. see. And you can also go back and see all of your payments. You don't have to do any sort of shifting around and putting everything together in one place yourself. It's all right there for you. So it's incredibly mm-hmm. useful because again, I'm blown away you, and you touched on it, but like the biggest, most profitable companies in the world can't make simple payments to their research sites it's just completely mind-blowing yeah. it's shock again it's really simple just be clear in your contract terms and then follow them that alone would yeah. increase things substantially because at least i would know what to actually expect pretty much keep your promises that's it transparency it sounds like communication solid communication and promises you honor what you say you're going to do it sounds like a great it seems simple enough doesn't it it seems like uh, the basis of any other successful relationship. I mean, it, it's no mm-hmm. different than anything else. Those are three things that I value anywhere you go, but you know, it's just incredibly yeah. lacking in the in the payment process. So without trying to play the opposite game, what would you completely avoid in payments? There are things that, I mean, obviously really extended payment terms, which we still do see. And uh, yeah. quarterly payment terms just don't disrespect sites like that. They just want to sit on money because you also know that three months is going to turn into probably five mm-hmm. uh, more often yep. than not. Or it'll um, just be forgotten. <laughs> right. And I'd say don't handcuff sites by really terrible screen fail ratios because you know you're doing everyone a disservice if mm-hmm. you know for i can only get paid for a screen fail for every four patients i randomize and your trial has a 60 percent screen fail rate because of a weird lab somewhere just don't mm-hmm. do that because i'm going to stop working on your trial i'm sorry i'm going to move on yeah. align your inclusion exclusion with the clinical feasibility there's there's a difference between scientific feasibility and clinical feasibility well yeah exactly if it's be willing to change it as time goes on too and also don't make sites go beg you for it if you're trying to build a successful study why wouldn't you be doing that from the cro or sites that sponsor side you know on yeah. your own without having sites to have to come back and say hey man half of everyone's screen failing because of your criteria you can't be paying us based off of a 10 percent screen fail rate fix it mm-hmm. i agree hold back which we talked about oh, don't, don't accept withholding <laughs> no. or do you, should i be able to withhold 10 percent of the data so don't hold don't try to hold back 10 percent of our our payments that's insane have you ever heard of a situation where a tenant charges a landlord a deposit <laughs> i mean no it's a good idea we all should try that well brad those are my questions, man. What, what do you think? What do you think about payments? It's it's still a mess. You know, I mean, look, here's my thing. I think the more, again, these are sponsors are shooting themselves in the foot at this point because some are catching mm-hmm. on and some are doing a good job. And frankly, those are the ones I'm going to work hard for. Would you work hard for a boss that doesn't pay you? Nope. You wouldn't. You would leave. You'd quit your job and you'd find a boss that would pay you. It's really no different. I have to imagine at some point there'll be a bigger competitive advantage for sponsors and CROs who are paying better and on time with better terms. And that may take some time to change. Mm -hmm. But for now, it's still extremely chaotic. But ultimately, you're also paying so that sites can allocate resources to maintain oversight. So at some point, bad payments become a GCP issue in my mind. Mm -hmm. And they become an oversight issue and a safety issue even. Because if you can't compensate us enough to allocate coordinator time and PI time to oversee your trial, then you're doing a disservice to the the patients, you know, not just the sites. So, you know, I'm hopeful and I'm hopeful for, you know, things like what you're doing. I would love to see some sort of continued, I guess, collaboration from sites to lift each other up because... Mm -hmm. Frankly, if everyone were to say, no, we're not going to do this, things would have to change. Mm -hmm. So I I think we'll continue to see that at probably a slow rate. But nonetheless, 
the better it increases, the healthier sites can be, which is going to be better for the whole clinical trial community. I agree. Brad, thanks for coming on to CRP and Central. I love having you on here. and I love these conversations. Let's let's keep them up. Let's keep letting people know about this. And always, uh, always happy to contribute any way I can. So thanks, Dr. Fox. All right. Thank you. And I'll see you in Tucson, Arizona, February 2nd, 2024, right? Heck yeah. All right. We'll be there. Our next guest comes with a strong background in the CRO and sponsor spaces. Dr. Robert Goldman is an industry leader with over 10 years of medical education and over 12 years of combined experience in clinical research operations and top tier CRO experience. He has a broad range of therapeutic area experiences with a passion for analgesia, CNS, respiratory, gastroenterology, endocrinology, and oncology. He entered clinical research at the site level and then quickly entered the industry at the CRO level. Currently, Robert is a director of operations at the sponsor level, leading pivotal studies for his company's lead asset. Robert is a visionary in his site advocacy sponsor roles, and he is a member of CRPN's Board of Advisors. Please welcome with me, Dr. Robert Goldman. Robert Goldman, thank you so much for coming to CRPN Central. Absolutely, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Just for our audience, could you tell us, just in your own words, a very brief introduction? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Robert Goldman. I've been in the industry now almost 12 and a half years, going on 13 years. Started at the site level, spent over a decade at the CRO side, the top five large CROs. Pick any combination of letters you like, and I've probably been there. Been a CRA, been a project manager, clinical trial manager, and I've been at the sponsor side now for almost two years. I am a currently a director of clinical operations, representing a sponsor currently in phase three of development, hoping to submit our first NDA within the next two years. Proud member of the board of advisors for CRPN and really a site advocate. So really happy to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Yes, and I'm so very thankful that you're on our board of advisors and that you came here today, Robert. Today, uh, our episode is about payments. I have four questions that are tailored to try to understand a sponsor's perspective or point of view about how payments are processed at sites. Before we start, just from your experience, are payments a problem for clinical research sites? Absolutely, in every way, shape, and form. Not only from receiving them, but structuring them from the get-go, making sure budgets are accurate as time goes on. There's a lot of things that are not considered when, when budgets are originally negotiated. For the continuity of the site's business, supplying, you know, everything that they need to be successful, not only just to deliver the study, but in, you know, retaining their staff. So absolutely, payments are just mission critical. Yeah. What's crazy is I think it's been a problem for a long time, but we really haven't found a good solution for all of the complexities that we have to address with it. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, we, we as sponsors lean on typically CROs, if, if that's your model, to outsource most of the work, which most small biotechs and, and pharma companies do, even large pharma, right? They They rely a lot on the CROs to administer grant payments and kind of be the gatekeepers to the financial resources that we provide CROs. We also, as sponsors, compensate the CRO a lot of money to to administer and manage the grant payment process. So definitely a lot of room for improvement. Well, let's dive into these questions. Here are my four questions to you. So from a sponsor's perspective, number one, Will you walk me through your understanding of the clinical trial payment process through a trial's life cycle? Sure, absolutely. You know, obviously, when we reach out and working through budget and CTA terms, we as a sponsor should know and the CRO should know your expectations as a site on the payment terms, right? Is it net 30 days? Is it quarterly? Is it bimonthly? Whatever those terms are. And we expect as a sponsor that payments are administered to sites based on what the contractual terms are. So based on line items that are invoiceable, whether they're agreed upon amounts, 
whether they require an invoice from a vendor that you have chosen to use at your site. We are to honor those CTA items and budget items without question and without really much pushback. Granted, there's some things that the sites need to do from data entry, producing an invoice that's corroborated against the EDC sometimes, but the payment process is, is, is fairly easy once you get past, or I should say should be easy, once you get past those critical steps in negotiating the budget and CTA terms. Again, there's, you know, a lot of variables, but if sites are required to invoice the CRO for the work done, those payments need to be made within line and within alignment of, of the CTA terms and, of course, the budget amounts that have been agreed upon. That should continue throughout the trial. There should be no interruption to that. There should be no delays and there should be no deviations in the amounts agreed upon. That's the process. I mean, it, it's not anything that should be difficult. Sites should be compensated for the work performed within the, the agreed upon timeline all the way through closeout. That's my understanding of it. I think my favorite part about your description is that, of course, you know, I, I made the PACT report, P-A-C-T, and the P in PACT is literally that of promises. And it feels like your answer, what you were, your expectation as a sponsor is just that. If we make promises, we expect those promises to be kept. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I will say as a sponsor representative, you know, there, there are other things outside of our control that sometimes prevent those promises from being delivered. So for the listeners out there, um, you know, it's not always in our ability to control things that are outside of our control where we may seem to have failed on those promises. So promises are are, are there to be to be made and to be kept. Absolutely. All right. Let's move to question number two. Question number two. What are the three best experiences that you've had in clinical trial payments? Like, close your eyes and tell me like the dream payments you've experienced. You know, sites just sending an email thanking us for timely payments. And because you were able to provide timely payments, we are able to do A, B, C, and D. That's phenomenal. But again, we as the sponsor don't typically or can't typically take credit for that as we are not the ones, you know, managing the grant payment administration. But that to me is a phenomenal, you know, accolade. The second one would be just quick, quick budget turnarounds, right? We present a fair budget that allows the site to not only operate in a financial positive, but it, it's it's attractive to them where they're able to prioritize our, our study, which as a result, enrollment is, is phenomenal and ahead of timelines. So that is always a, a great feedback that I love to hear when sites are able to receive our budget and we're able to negotiate very quickly because it's fair to begin with. And the third thing that I love, love, love to hear is that there's just no hiccups in communication, right? If a site needs to execute a contract amendment or a budget amendment because their patient stipends are are not in line with the increase in gas or in line with inflation, and we're able to honor that request very quickly and the appreciation from the sites because that allows them to retain their patients to start that having that dialogue also brings me a great sense of joy. So that would be my quick and dirty answer for those three questions, Daniel. Wow. Uh, well, we'll come to an analysis of that here in a minute, uh, but I'll go to number three because it's kind of like the compliment. Now I want you to close your eyes and I want you to tell me your three biggest nightmares in site payments, like the ones that are complete turnoff, like I will never work with this again. This is just terrible. Yeah, I mean, I'll start with number one. And, and, and I know there's a lot of argument on it and we can probably have a whole discussion around it, but that that billable invoice item that sites try and hit us with for the CRA change fee. Ah, yes. Man, that one just gets me in my lower gut <laughs> and it just grinds at me. So I'll give you that as my number one disaster and I can go on and on and on and why I hate that. But I, I got to just be honest with you that that is my number one. Number two is just things that don't seem to be fair when you when you know uh, a fee for a certain procedure is 
extraordinarily inflated by the site. That that to me is a is a big big nightmare and a, and a red flag because you know that this procedure shouldn't cost what they're billing you for it, and then when you ask for justification rationale or or heaven forbid an invoice from the vendor directly. Sites sometimes don't want to provide it because they know they've inflated that particular line item. Mm -hmm. So that that's really painful to go through. And then the third one is just when the total cost per patient is so disconnected from the template provided. And I'm not talking a couple thousand bucks, Daniel. I'm talking when it's like double, for example, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We're just worlds apart. That would be my, my converse answer to question number two. Mm-hmm. Well, and I could imagine if, if the sites return a budget back to you that's just like way out of the park, more than you had ever planned, that kind of derails all of your plans. So all the way back up to trying to get your budget approved for your entire project. Well, absolutely, right? Because we, we have an idea of what our investigator grant payment bucket cash flow is going to look like for the duration of the study, plus or minus several thousand dollars up or down. So you're absolutely right. It, it's not something that's that's uh, pleasurable in any sense of the of the word. But then at the other hand, I like to understand on why the budget needs to be that way. Maybe the mm-hmm. site has a phenomenal rationale and, hey, listen, I, I got to give sites the benefit of the doubt. Maybe there's a good rationale, but there's not always time to dig deep to figure out what that is. And Sometimes just for the sake of keeping up with timelines, you have to cut ties and just say thank you, but no thank you. Yep. And going back to the the general idea of your grant payments, where do you normally get that information? Like how we're going to create our template? Mm -hmm. Like your initial budget that you provide to the sites. Well, you know, we lean a lot on the CRO to look at what other similar studies, similar indications, historical data that they have access to and kind of formulating budgets around what sites have been amenable to in the past, which I can admit is not, albeit the greatest way of doing things, but we do have to start somewhere. Budget templates and starting off hoping to be competitive, it, it, it's its its pretty tough. It's you know? tricky. It's really it's tricky. tricky. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a better than nothing start off, and then you have to work from there. I have one more question for this podcast. It kind of combines the last two questions. Given our discussion, what do you think is needed to have successful payments and what do you think should be avoided? So number one, what's needed is companies, they're well-funded, right? That's number one. Number two is is clear lines of communications between the sponsor counterparts and the CRO counterparts who are administering the grant payments. For mm-hmm. example, having folks who are assigned in other time zones, ex-USA, you know, obviously if you're working on a global study, it behooves all parties to have contacts in each region that are aligned in that time zone. Because there's nothing more frustrating for a site reaching out for whether the payment's been delayed, whether their invoice that was submitted was never acknowledged. There has to be that efficiency in communication in order to make sure that things are done right. Also, sites should maybe re- receiving reminders, you know, hey, it's it's 30 days and we haven't received your invoice yet. That would just increase site satisfaction. Obviously, it's up to the site to submit the invoice. But again, I lean back on effective communication, reliable communication mm-hmm. and partnerships, right? Sites are our partners. They're not somebody who just works for us. That's not my viewpoint. They are, you know, a valued partner who, without them, we wouldn't exist, right? We wouldn't be able to bring these therapies to market. So I think the dynamic in in the way in which sites are viewed need to really change. And CROs, I know, value them as well, but not maybe as much as they should. And I just think having the right resources in place to ensure timely payments and that cross collaborative communication is is critical to the, to the success and satisfaction of a site you know to be a sponsor of choice and to have um I'll reflect back to uh, your pack scores daniel mm-hmm. in order to have a above standard 
industry standard PAC score, sites need to be satisfied. They want, you know, I want a site to work with us again in the future, whether it's a sister study, whether it's on another compound. My goal is to always have a good reputation, not personally, but working for the company, the company's reputation. Obviously, I care about my reputation too, but the the company's <laughs> reputation, right, is is critical so that you get those relationships built and you're able to, you know, execute quickly, fairly, and with quality so that we can get these therapies to market. I really like the first one, the, the best experiences. The very first thing that came to your mind was almost a feeling of appreciation or like appreciation for the appreciation from sites. It sounds like a sponsor is interested in, like you said, creating those professional collaborative relationships where we can work together to accomplish a similar goal. Absolutely. You know, I think, you know, no site wakes up in the middle, you know, in, in the day and, and wants to create havoc or problems and, and neither do sponsors. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to believe CROs don't either. So you're absolutely right. We're all working towards a common goal. But at the end of the day, we have to call it what it is. And it's a business. And in order to conduct research with patient centricity at the forefront, you have to be you you have to have business continuity and people are not coming to work every day not to be paid for the work that they're doing so it's just critical it's just like that life cycle that we talked about right it keeps the ball moving it keeps sites engaged it keeps people motivated when things are going the way that we expect them to go and then in turn as a result by proxy Enrollment challenges aren't aren't as prevalent as they typically are, right? Data entry delays aren't as prevalent as they typically are. Response delays aren't as prevalent as they typically are. They're encouraged to respond to you. They're encouraged to get that data in the system. They're encouraged to be above bore on their source. You know, you're getting great feedback from monitoring visits. The reg binder is always up to date. Reg docs are up to date. They're submitting CVs to you without having to, you know, ask for them. They're sending updated training certificates without having to ask for them because things are just going. Things are moving. You're keeping them motivated. So I don't want to say that money is is the payments are the root uh, cause of, of success. I'm not saying that, but it certainly helps. I think when sites don't have to chase, when they don't have to beg, where they don't have to claw for for what they're entitled to, the relationship is there. And I do appreciate that for all my sites. You know, that relationship is is critical to the success. Again, as you mentioned, you know, we're all working for a common goal. I don't think anybody wants to work on a study where we know it's going to fail. So, you know, that 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 yeah. that common collaborative attitude of success for the patients is really what it's all about, in my opinion. And going back to the negative experiences, I know that two of them, at least, were about almost like trust value that has been broken on the level. It's like it's obvious these sites are hyper inflating this cost. I know this isn't what it really costs. It's like they're lying to me and I don't like that. Is that right? Kind of, you know, what spurs that negativity is almost a break in trust. It's it's right on the money. I mean, we don't need to talk any really further about that. It's it, it's exactly an, an erosion of trust. Mm-hmm. It's an erosion of confidence. I mean, that to me is exactly what it is. Again, going back into your PAC score, you know, the promises mm-hmm. and 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 the choice and the trust. That that's all. That that's what it's all about. You know, because then what's next? You know, what's what's in store for me in the future? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and nothing worse than, you know, bringing a site on who doesn't perform. They don't do what they say they're going to do. You know, I'm happy to be fair. I'm happy to be reasonable with good rationale and justification. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. But when that's the first impression, Daniel, you're absolutely right. It, it's that erosion of trust. It's just gone. I wonder if sometimes like those hyper inflated costs that you experience kind of like, you know, when you go to the hospital and you pay $50 for an aspirin, it, it's <laughs> like uh, 
cost shifting where you know that that product is not worth $50, but it's charged $50 to try to pay for things that are missed, that are underfunded. So it's almost like you have to hyperinflate everything to pay for all costs. Yeah, and because payments are such a problem across our industry, you know, I don't blame a site. If that's the reason, I don't blame a site for doing that. But that's when that collaborative relationship that we talked about, Daniel, has to come to the forefront of the conversation. It's like, hey, exactly. look, I'm not, you know, I, I made this be this this number because we always get burned here and I need to make sure that I can cover this be that I always get underfunded on so that I have to hyperinflate this. Like, okay, then then we come to a common ground and we make sure that the site has what they need and we don't have to hyperinflate for the fear of us rejecting, you know, your request on something that's maybe less reasonable, right? So you're mm-hmm. absolutely right. It's 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 maybe that could be that could be a reason, right? There's 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 probably mm-hmm. dozens and dozens of reasons that we could come up with. Again, I I pivot back to what I mentioned, you know, the curiosity typically gets the best of me and I want to understand, you know, why did they send back a budget that's double? I mean, it's not, I don't believe, I don't believe that they're being greedy. You know, that's not my knee jerk reflex response. I don't believe that for a moment, but that's when, you know, the negotiations between the CRO and, and the site, I, I wish sometimes I was involved sooner. Because, you know, it gets to the point where the CRO just will say, well, you're so far apart. This is way above our, our, you know, parameters. I would have to go back to the sponsor with every single line item. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes the CRO doesn't even involve us and they make decisions, you know, that I'm unaware of until the site reaches out to me directly and says, yeah. hey, by no, the way. The, <laughs> odds are the CRO is going to charge you for all that renegotiation anyway. Oh, so it's even more cost to you. You can both. Believe that one. That 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 you can put in your pocket. That's <laughs> that's will. a fact. Yeah, <laughs> that's a All fact. Right. But yeah, in karate. So I teach karate. I've been in karate for almost two decades now. And one of the things that we always say is when it comes to an escalation where people are yelling at each other, the worst thing you can ever do is yell back because if you yell back, then they get louder, and then you have to get louder to top them. The best thing you can possibly do is whisper. Because if you whisper, those people who are all ramped up and yelling and ready for a fight, they have to stop and their brain has to listen really hard to your voice. And it allows them to de-escalate. This could be utilized almost in a budget level where maybe instead of trying to fight hyperinflation with hyperinflation and constantly trying to drive these costs up, We could really look at why something is hyperinflated and then maybe try to prevent that work and then help everyone out. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. I love that. I love that. Whisper, whisper, whisper. Absolutely. I always try to whisper. So let's try to budget with a whisper and then try to just get this clinical research to the finish line as efficiently as possible. I love it. Good. Well, Robert, Thank you so much for joining CRP and Central. I had an absolute blast, and I know for a fact that our listeners are going to really appreciate this conversation. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. We'll talk very soon. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Very interesting discussions with our guests today. Brad Hightower shared with us the challenges he faces every day as a clinical site administrator. Payments are a major problem to sites and their well-being. It is very rare to receive payments on time. Sites are lucky to receive payments months after promised times, and it's no exaggeration to wait months, if not years, to receive payments for work performed. If payments are received according to agreed-upon terms, they are often not complemented with the information needed to properly remit the compensation. Brad's expectations for a strong professional relationship are simply to present clear and understandable payment terms and just keep your promises in the contract. That's it. If you say you're going to do something, you follow through. You pay sites for the work that they do. You don't lock them into ridiculous terms like screen failure ratios that sets everybody up for failure. 
and you honor the basic and fundamental needs for any kind of good working relationship. Robert talked about his experience as both a sponsor and a site advocate. Sponsors pay CROs a lot of money to manage payments to sites, and as a result, sponsors expect sites should be paid according to contractual agreements in place. Promises should be kept and sites should be paid for the work they perform. Robert works hard to work with his sites. However, he also feels the sites who ask for overprices or under transparency in payments could erode working trust relationships in the industry and create a disconnect between site activities and sponsor compensation predictions. Interestingly, both of today's guests highly valued transparency communication, and promises kept. They believe strong working relationships fully rely on honored contractual terms, and they both acknowledge exactly how important it is to pay sites on time for the services they perform. Perhaps that is the key. We need to understand how to promote transparent and honest communication among all of our industry collaborators. How do we ensure promises are kept? How do we hold those accountable for breaking them? And once forged, how do we maintain these newly found strong relationships? Look, we aren't going to solve decades of toxicity, misunderstanding, and corruption in a one-hour podcast. However, we can start simply by raising awareness and advocating for the change. We can only continue to speak in hopes that our voice will become loud enough to make real and progressive change. All right, everyone, that concludes episode two of CRPN Central. Thank you to all of our CRPN and CRPN Central supporters. Thanks again to Brad and Robert for joining me in today's discussions. Thank you to my community voices, Mr. Steve Wimmer, Terrell Payton, Emily Epstein, and Brandy Starks. And finally, thank you Medvector for making this podcast possible. Please remember to register for our Save Our Sites conference, February 2nd, 2024, Tucson, Arizona, at saveoursites.com. And thank you for supporting our sites and their well-being. Thank you again to everyone, and we'll see you next time on CRPN Central.